Excuse me, they're not. Oh my gosh. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous. But a little bit smoky over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization uh, where we are now in the windy month of March we are at Wednesday March 2nd 2022 so Wednesday is when I'm trying to bring you my oilprice.com roundup by the way, the price of oil, I guess, right now is $112, which I believe is the highest it has been in eight years. And uh, I think we know the reason for that. Talking about $4 a gallon gas here in Florida in the next couple of weeks. But anyway, guys, you will not be surprised obviously that the virtually the entire oilprice.com roundup today is about that little distraction going on over there in uh, whatever that country is begins with a U. So uh, as you guys might have noticed I am trying to resist the temptation to comment on that but I am thrilled to find in the middle of all of this, we have this long, involved essay, which I don't think has anything or virtually nothing to do with that little distraction going on across the pond over there by our old friend Gail Tverberg, energy analyst Gail Tverberg. I have interviewed Gail. You can find that somewhere here uh, on Collapse Chronicles, but Gail showing up in oilprice.com, but this is a reprint from her excellent blog, Our Finite, is it Our Finite Planet, or Our Finite, uh, Our Finite World, I believe. Good Lord, once again, Gail, our finite world. Gail has done her homework and brought us a book length manuscript titled The Biggest Problem with the Green Energy Revolution. So uh, I'm going to put the link on here. Good Lord, it would take me well over an hour to read this. She has all her charts and graphs for all of you chart lovers. I'm barely going to be able to scratch the surface. I'm going to read the little introduction. We're going to hit her main bullets and then wrap up with the conclusions. And you can go on the link and, uh, and fill in all of the missing parts uh, if you are trying to understand the biggest problem with the green energy revolution and there's plenty of problems to choose from <clears throat> mainly that it's a big fat lie is the biggest problem <clears throat> it's a big fat lie and it ain't gonna happen and it ain't gonna save the planet but I'm gonna turn it over to Gail and let her explain it to us <clears throat> take it away Gail to Verberg we have been told that intermittent electricity from wind and solar, perhaps along with hydroelectric generation or hydro, can be the basis of a green economy. Things are increasingly not working out as planned, however. Hmm. Natural gas or coal used for balancing the intermittent output of the renewables is increasingly high priced or not available. I also learned here that coal hit $300 uh, a couple of days ago, the highest price of coal in history as the price of oil, the highest in eight years. It is becoming clear that modelers who encourage the view that a smooth transition to wind, solar, and hydro is possible 
have missed some important points. Let's look at some of the issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the main bullet in a little paragraph and she breaks it down. Number one, <clears throat> it is becoming clear that intermittent wind and solar cannot be counted on to provide an adequate electricity supply when the electrical distribution system needs them. You know, when the system needs them. <clears throat> Early modelers did not expect that the variability of wind and solar would be a huge problem. They seem to believe that with the use of enough intermittent renewables, their variability would cancel out. Alternatively, long transmission lines would allow enough transfer of electricity between locations to largely offset variability. Then she breaks all that down more, but I just have to go down the main points and her conclusions. Number two. Adequate storage for electricity is not feasible in any reasonable time frame. This means that if cold countries are not to freeze in the dark during winter, fossil fuel backup is likely to be needed for many years into the future. Today, the amount of electricity storage that is available can be measured in minutes or hours. It is mostly used to buffer short-term changes such as the wind temporarily ceasing to blow or the rapid transition created when the sun sets and citizens are in the middle of cooking dinner. What is needed is the capacity for multiple months of electricity storage. Such storage would require an amazingly large quantity of materials to produce. Needless to say, if such storage were included, the cost of the overall electrical system would be substantially higher than we have been led to believe. All major types of cost analyses leave out the need for storage <clears throat> if balancing with other electricity production is not available. Okay, point number three, after many years of subsidies and mandates, today's green electricity is only a tiny fraction of what is needed to keep our current economy operating. Early modelers did not consider how difficult it would be to ramp up green electricity. Compared to today's total world energy consumption, wind and solar are truly insignificant. In 2020, wind accounted for 3% of the world's total energy consumption and solar amounted to 1% of total energy. Thus, the combination of wind and solar produced 4% of world energy in 2020. Uh, and then she breaks all this down with all her charts and graphs. Uh, okay, point number four. Even as a percentage of electricity rather than total energy, renewables still comprised a relatively small share in 2020. Wind and solar do not replace dispatchable generation. They provide some temporary electricity supply, but they tend to make the overall 
electrical system more difficult to operate because of the variability introduced. Renewables are available only part of the time, so other types of electric electricity suppliers are still needed when supply temporarily is not available. Yes, uh, and she breaks all this down uh, about why we're so doomed. Okay, point number five, or I should say bright green line number five. <clears throat> Most modelers have not understood that reserves to production ratios greatly overstate the amount of fossil fuels and other minerals that the economy will be able to extract. Most modelers have not understood how the world economy operates. They have assumed that as long as we have the technical capability to extract fossil fuels or other minerals, we will be able to do so. A popular way of looking at resource availability is as reserve to production ratios. Uh, anyway, guys, I would love to go on with this. Good Lord, uh, she get she has done her homework. Uh, the problem underlying the recent spike in prices seems to be diminishing returns. The problem that eventually hits the economy is that it cannot maintain economic growth. Yep, yep, yep. Anyway, guys, point six. The world economy seems already to be reaching limits on the extraction of coal and natural gas to be used for balancing electricity provided by intermittent renewables. Coal and natural gas are expensive to transport, so if they are exported, they primarily tend to be exported to countries that are nearby. Yes, we're... Uh, anyway, then she has all of these charts and graphs and figures. I mean, this woman, where does she find time uh, to do this? Uh, good Lord, she, uh, th this woman, uh, it would take me three hours to read this. I think Gail has written a book here. But anyway, guys, let's... Uh, Let's just boil this all down and get to Gail Tverberg's conclusions. All right, here is the bottom line after crunching all of these numbers, these charts, these graphs, these facts and figures and statistics. Conclusion, modelers and leaders everywhere have had a basic misunderstanding of how the economy operates and what limits we are up against. This misunderstanding has allowed scientists to put together models that are far from the situation we are actually facing. The economy operates as an integrated whole, just as the body of a human being operates as an integrated whole rather than a collection of cells of different types. This is something most modelers do not understand and their techniques are not equipped to deal with. The economy is facing many limits simultaneously. Too many people being the number one uh, thing it's facing. 
the economy is facing many limits simultaneously. Too many people, too much pollution, too few fish in the ocean, more difficult to extract fossil fuels, and many others. The way these limits play out seems to be the way the models in the 1972 book, The Limits to Growth, suggest. They play out on a combined basis. The real problem is that diminishing returns leads to huge investment needs in many areas simultaneously. One or two of these investment needs could perhaps be handled, but not all of them all at once. The approach of modelers practically everywhere is to break down a problem into small parts and assume that each part of the problem can be solved independently. Thus, those concerned about peak oil have been concerned about running out of oil. Finding substitutes seem to be important. Those concerned about climate change were convinced that huge amounts of fossil fuels remain to be extracted even more than the amounts indicated by reserve to production ratios. Their concern was finding substitutes for the huge amount of fossil fuels that they believed remain to be extracted, which could cause climate change. Politicians could see that there was some sort of huge problem on the horizon, but they did not understand what it was. The idea of substituting renewables for fossil fuels seemed to be a solution that would make both peak oilers and those concerned about climate change happy. Models based on the substitution of renewables for fossil fuels seem to please almost everyone. The renewables approach suggested that we have a very long time frame to deal with, putting the problem off as long into the future as possible. Today, we are starting to see that renewables are not able to live up to the promise modelers hoped they would have. Exactly how the situation will play out is not entirely clear, but it looks like we will all have front row seats in finding out. Thank you, Gail Tverberg, for your uh, hard work down here in the Dumasphere. And of course, here at Collapse Chronicles, we will be keeping your front row seat to uh, the collapse as uh, we figure out how it is all going to play out. But play out or bleed out is, I think, a better term. Bleed out it will. And uh, I will try to sit here and do my little part to chronicle it for you so you can help. Uh, so you can learn how doomed we are. But with that, for our weekly oilprice.com rant, uh, I need to wrap up and head out on this absolutely gorgeous, windy, smoky day and uh, continue unscrewing hundreds of screws to move this tiny house to New York, maybe. Get out there and enjoy this while you still can, guys. Don't know how many more of these beautiful days we have to look forward to, do we? Bye, guys.